Um, some years ago, I was reading Titus 2.11. And in Titus 2.11, as Roger recently preached about, is the school of grace. Mrs. Grace is doing what? Grace came for salvation, instructing us to do a bunch of things. Instructing us to deny ungodliness. To, instructing us to live righteously. Um, and, and it kind of jarred me because I had always been sort of in this, I, I could say, frustrating place with Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Because everybody quotes Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 for, 9, for by grace you've been saved, and that not of yourselves, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. And it's like, okay, but, but is that really telling the story about grace? So then I started to think about it and... I want to make some links today. And so let's look at Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So there's this concept of salvation being the power of God. But as we're going to find out, there's also a representation of the power of God with grace. So I want to distinguish between mercy and grace tonight. So if we go, go to slide three. So in the Old Testament, mercy occurs 42 times and the New Testament 59 times. And a lot of the New Testament occurrences are actually in the Gospels where people ask Jesus to have mercy on them. So it's kind of Old Testament in a way. Um, the word is uh, kapareth or racham in the Old Testament, and um, Kapareth is the mercy seat, so it's directly indicating the, the um, Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. And so there it's de dealing with appeasement, appeasing God, uh, we will not inherit his wrath, you know, th those kinds of things. Um, and then pity, and so it just gave an interesting perspective, because pity has no power. When you, if someone has pity on you, you might even get angry. You might need pity, but you might get angry. Don't pity me. I don't need your pity. I, you know, I'm sure those conversations have happened. So it's just an interesting thought process for me, going back to the Hebrew. But the New Testament, Elios, also is pity. So it just... So there's a def some definitions. I just did that out of the dictionary. Um, the bottom one is one that I kind of wrote up, trying to compile everything. An act of forgiving or reconciling when you have power to do otherwise. So mercy is a kind of a consummation of forgiveness. Just, I will not hold this against you. Now, it might be out of pity, but I would say God is... His mercy is deeper than that. But from our perspective, it's, it's healthy to forgive, to have mercy, even if all, the only reason you're doing it is because you're, you feel pity. That's not bad. You should still forgive. The other person might not be happy that you had pity, but um, let's go to the next slide, please. So mercy demonstrated. Um, and these verses, I've actually said to my children, they're grown now, so I hope this doesn't get out there. Um, I told each of my three children that no matter what you do, I will never be your enemy, ever. Doesn't matter what you do. Makes no difference to me. I choose never to be your enemy. And it's based on these verses. So Romans 8, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then in verse 10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? So there's mercy, the mercy of God, having pity on us. We're in a condition of sin. We're enemies. And we'll get into Ephesians a little bit later. So I'm very thankful for God's pity upon me and his mercy. Then 
mercy applied, if you look at Philemon, there's this appeal that Paul, and so mercy is an appeal, and we'll get back to that in a little bit. But Paul appeals to Philemon for Onesimus. Onesimus is a servant that's run away from Philemon and stole from Philemon. And Paul appeals to him and says, I want you to forgive him. And if there's anything that he owes you, you charge me. That's a picture. That's a live, this is what happened, how mercy was applied. This is, a, a, this is real. Paul really appealed. Paul really held Philemon to this. And it's a kind of a picture of Christ. Our sins are charged against Jesus' account. And Onesimus, in the whole story, Paul actually declares that now Philemon has gotten him back, not just as a servant, but as a brother in Christ. So it's an amazing, it's really beautiful. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. So now we go to grace. And there's a connotation in the Old Testament and the New Testament favor. That's, that's the word, favor. It only occurs nine times in the Old Testament. Fascinating. Fascinating concept that it's there only nine times. I don't want to go into all the details where it is, but it's, it's interesting. So it's worth looking up in a concordance and see where it's used and how it's used. But 122 times in the New Testament. Now, half of that is Paul writing grace and peace, you know, to you. But it's the same word. It's, it's the same word, favor. And it's chariz. And charisma comes from that word. So, to me, that's an interesting dynamic. Because what do we think of when we think of a person with charisma? They're a powerful person. They have power. They, they present dynamically. That's to us, we, that person has charisma. So there's grace and power. So that's kind of the first indicator that as I was looking at this, it's like, yeah, there, Romans 1.16, it's more than just the power of God of salva- for, for salvation. is isn't just about mercy. It's more than that. So, um, so then we have some definitions. We already talked some of those. I wrote down at the bottom, that's kind of my own concoction, an act of bestowing rights and privileges without merit. And what I was thinking about is a relationship. And an example of that was Nehemiah. Nehemiah was before the king as a wine taster, and the king said, why is your face fallen down? And here, Nehemiah has been grieving over Jerusalem and how it was torn down. And and, um, the king bestowed his favor on Nehemiah, and all of a sudden, Nehemiah had all these resources to do all these marvelous things. It's fascinating, because to me, that's a picture of grace. But let's go to the next slide. So grace demonstrated. Let's, let's look at Romans 5.17. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. There's a lot there. There's a gift of righteousness that comes with grace. And you reign in life. What does that, what does that mean? That, that's not just some eternal someplace in the future. Paul's indicating that by this grace and the gift of righteousness, we reign now. We, we have authority now. We have favor bestowed upon us now. We have authority and we have power and we have resources now. So to me, that's really when the, the difference between mercy and grace starts to show. Because pity doesn't bestow power, but grace bestows power. So, um, Titus 2.11, we already talked about that, the school of grace. So, grace applied. 
2 Corinthians, tw- um, did I have 2 Corinthians? Yeah, 12, 9. There Paul is talking about this thorn in the flesh. Everybody always wonders what that is. But the dynamic is God says, and it says, Paul said, and he has said to me. So Jesus said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Directly linked to grace. So here we are again with grace. Um, I, just, I just find that liberating. I'm not um, a constant debtor to Christ. I shouldn't forget, Paul never forgot where he came from. Paul never forgot that he was a chief sinner, that he murdered Christians. He, he never forgot that. But he didn't owe that debt anymore. So he didn't walk around carrying it. And I think sometimes we carry around our debts a little too much. Um, let's go to the next slide. So here is the whole of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 in context. And I would like to read it. I mean, it's up on the screen, but um, 1 through 10. And I think this encapsulates the whole picture, and it even says it directly. But we hear Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, so we we don't really connect it the way Paul does. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Going back to Cindy's comment that we're not going to have the wrath of God upon us. But God being rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And so this is where I think, let's call it a mistake, happens. We equate mercy and grace. That's not what Paul's saying. And Charity, my daughter, said a very interesting thing. She actually said it to me today. She said, mercy covers the past. Grace provides for the future. Interesting. Because look at what Paul says. By grace you have been saved. So right after he says you've been made alive together with Christ, you're you're still linking that to mercy kind of because he said that. But he says, by grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Grace is for the future. Grace is power for the future. In order that in the ages to come, he, God, might show the surpassing richness of his grace, riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So riches of his mercy, being rich in mercy, Riches of his grace. Paul distinguishes between those two things. Um, so then we go to 8, 9, and 10. And now, the, to me, as, as I think about this, the concept of mercy and grace take on a different meaning and verses 8 through 10 take on a different meaning or a deeper maybe meaning, not so much different, but a deeper meaning. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. For we are, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I, I thought about this, and it's like, okay, Paul talks about works in the first part in verse 9, not as a result of works, and you could put in there, of the law ceremonial or otherwise, the Old Testament law. But then he says good works in verse 10 that God prepared beforehand. And I thought about the conversation as I was trying to sift through this. 
I thought about the conversation that Jesus had with the man who said to him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. And so then I I thought, that's what grace does. Grace, by God's riches that he pours out, enables us to do his good works. They're not our good works. They're not our stuff that we conjure up. Okay, what could we do to propitiate? What could we do to appease? What could we do to earn? What could we? No, the, those are the works of the law. And so by grace, we've been saved for the future, as in we appeal to mercy, we ask for forgiveness, God bestows his grace, and then we are prepared, we, are, we have power, we have his unlimited riches, his unlimited storehouse available to us to do what he has asked us to do. I'm trying to figure that out is another topic for something else. But um, So then I, I want to go finally to um, Matthew 20, 1 through 20, and I'm just going to tell the story. Read it on your own. You see if what I'm saying is right. Lori and I talked about this, and Lori had a really interesting perspective on this, which I'll share at the end. So Jesus is telling the story of the owner of the vineyard, and he goes out early in the morning, and he goes finds people to work in the vineyard. It says that he agrees with them what they should be paid, and they go to work for him in the vineyard. Then Jesus goes out again at three, or you know, he goes out at different times, and he finds more people to come work. So he goes, doesn't agree. He just says, come work in my vineyard. They go. They go work in his vineyard. At the 11th hour, he comes out in the town and he says, why are you people standing here? Well, no one hired us. We, we don't have any work. Nobody hired us. He says, go work in my vineyard. No agreement, no nothing. Doesn't tell them they're going to get paid. This tells them, go work in my vineyard. So at the end of the parable the owner of the vineyard calls the people to come and he says, make sure the people who are brought in last come first. And he gives them a denarius, which is what the people agreed at the beginning of the day. So they grumble. <laughs> they say, well, oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, how, how did that happen? How, how? We worked all day. The sun's hot. The master says, well, we agreed. Are you upset that I'm generous? And he rebukes them. And then he says, Jesus says, the, first will, the last will be first and the first will be last. And so Lori and I were talking about this and Lori said something really I, I never saw in the passage before, but it was brilliant because she defined what mercy was in application and what grace was in application in this one parable. Mercy was the owner going out and getting the people to come work. So when they went, to, so if we're going to equate this to salvation, when they came to work for him in the vineyard, they were saved. When they agreed, they're in. They're his workers. They belong to him. They, he's going to pay them. All the other people, even the 11th hour people, when his mercy called them to come work and they did they agreed to go work that mercy brought them into the kingdom or the vineyard grace was when he paid them and there's one other thing that Lori said is that it wasn't just that he paid them they got to work they got to work that whole time and then the picture of faith comes into play because here these people were they, the first people agreed, so they had a better, not a better faith, a better picture of what was going to happen because they agreed to work and he agreed to pay them. But the other people doesn't say anything about they agreed to get paid for him. They just didn't have any work to do, so he was putting them into work. But they got to work in his vineyard and they all got the grace at the end, the payment, the reward. 
So there's a there's just a layered so mercy again, it's just that initial contact point. So let's go to the next slide. So some things to think about. Mercy is the doorway to a transformed life for God. You become God's. You become his. Grace is the pathway to a transformed life with God. And so to me, that's just some musings that I've had about the difference between mercy and grace, and it does help me. So I just want to close with this one thing. And Andrew and I were talking a couple weeks ago about this kind of concept and trying to discuss a little bit. And we, it was like when you're, when you're walking by grace, if you stumble, if you suddenly find yourself not in that power, you're not in that walk of grace, you're not, you don't sense that God's working in you and through you, you can always appeal to mercy. You can always go back to that place where you knew you needed forgiveness. And when you do, the power of grace is immediately available. Now, if the workers in the vineyard, for example, had stopped working, well, I, yeah, there's no grace active there. Now, they realize, ooh, I better get back to work. You know, and so again, it, but it's doing his work that he'd prepared. It wasn't something they were doing to try to get into the vineyard. So when we fall short, when we stumble, when we fail, when we don't see clearly, when we don't even like God very much, we can repent, we can say, Lord, I need your forgiveness. Help my unbelief. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to love someone that's unlovable. I know you loved me, and I know you're asking me to love this person, but I don't know how to do it. I need your grace, but more than that, I need your mercy because I, I hate that person. I need your forgiveness. I can't get along with that person. I don't even, my voice changes when I talk to that person because they make me really, really angry, and I don't know how to help that. I don't. So we can appeal to mercy, and God will bestow his grace. He has all the storehouses. He has all the riches. All those workers in that vineyard, they knew if they, went, if they needed something, they could go to that owner and say, hey, I don't have all the tools I need to do my job.